Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. Well, hello everyone and welcome to my library. If you're new here, hi, my name is Chinsia. And if you're not new here and you're one of my lovely regulars, hi, how are you? I hope you're doing splendidly. So today's part two of our Persephone and Hades and Demeter series. We started off with the Demeter, which was a very long video. Thank you for those of you who got through that. This one's a lot shorter because there's much less out there on Persephone. In the first video, I cover the original myth of Demeter, Persephone and Hades. So if you're not familiar, you'll have to go back to the beginning of video one. In today, we're just going to talk about the symbolism of Persephone and what it may mean archaeologically speaking. As I said, there's that actually very little out there. Um, there's not much left over. Demeter was the main figure in this mythology. Demeter was the main figure in, you know, mythologically speaking, so there's more archaeological evidence about her. Persephone was a lesser figure, which is ironic considering now she's the main protagonist in retellings today. But we'll also talk about potentially why it has ended up being romanticised at the end of the video. So if you're curious about that, please stay in. And before we get into the actual myth, let's take a moment to thank today's sponsor, which is Squarespace. Now, Squarespace is a very loyal sponsor, keeping this channel afloat, and I cannot thank them enough. And and I've actually built all of my main business websites over the past few years with Squarespace because I love how intuitive and easy it makes website design and layout. I don't know anything about coding, which is made using other website, you know, platforms a little bit tricky to say the least and very frustrating as well. But I don't have that issue at all with Squarespace because it can be as simple as dragging and dropping your content where you want it, moving things around. It's really darn fun. And if you're a creator who wants to expand your revenue stream, then Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that makes it easy for you to monetize your content and expertise in a way that fits your brand. So Squarespace member area lets you sell your courses or classes to followers. And Squarespace also has an inbuilt email campaign option where you can collect email subscribers and convert them into loyal customers all from your website. And the built-in analytics feature gives you insight into who's visiting your site, traffic sources, time they spend on your site, most read content, audience geography, and so much more. So if you want to expand to your business or just build a beautiful site for your blogging leisure, then go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And then when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash lady of the library to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you, Squarespace, for being such a loyal supporter of this channel. And now let's talk about the Persephone myth. So Persephone was a young girl on the verge of womanhood and was thus the age appropriate for an initiation into adulthood. Her byname, Kor or Kore, in the Homeric dialect in Attic means young girl of initiatory age and is synonymous with the word Parthenos, which means maiden or virgin while the Latin sources of her myth regularly call her Virgo, or make references to her virginity. However, the myths make sure to emphasise that she is ready to move into adulthood, as demonstrated in the Homeric Hymn of Demeter, which refers to her as Thelere, meaning ripened. As we know from the first video, where I told the myth of the story, Zeus and Hades planned her abduction, with Gaia being instructed to create a beautiful Narcissus flower to lure Persephone away from the protection of the nymphs watching her. The Homeric hymn of Demeter stresses how Persephone was an unwilling participant. The moment she was snatched by Hades, she begins screaming for help, particularly out to her father, Zeus, who actually orchestrated the entire thing. As the poem goes, not one of the immortals nor mortal man heard her voice, nor the olive trees whose fruit is goodly. The scene, when you think about it, is actually incredibly distressing and upsetting to read. It's a tragic tale of a young girl being stripped away from her home, sexually attacked and forced into marriage, and no one comes to her aid, not even her father, which makes the glorification of this couple in contemporary literature and media a little bit confusing. The only person who stands up for her daughter is, and what she truly wants isn't her father, but her mother. As Bruce Lincoln explains in his essay on the topic. Oh, it jumped. Why did it jump? Got distraction because puppy wanted to come up. So 
As Bruce Lincoln explains in his essay on the topic, the circumstances in which her father is a motive agent in his daughter's abduction, acting against the wishes of the girl and her mother, has posed a difficult problem for interpretation. Some have been inclined to see a hidden enmity between the celestial father god, Zeus, and the terrestrial mother goddess, Demeter, perhaps dating back to the opposition of Indo-European and pre-Indo-European or Olympian and Chthonic religious forms. Zeus and Demeter disagree violently as to what shall be the proper fate for their daughter. Whilst most texts seem to follow the Homeric hymn, sympathising with Demeter, there's no reason to view Zeus's actions as sinister or perverse. He is Persephone's parent, no less than Demeter is, and his motives are more big picture and focus on the family lineage and Greek kinship ideology, whilst Demeter's are focused on the individual needs and the concerns of her daughter. For the ancient Greeks, the mother was the biological parent, whilst the father was the social one, which has led some scholars to believe that the myth is a metaphorical depiction of marriage. However, as Lincoln says, this is unlikely considering Hades is Persephone's uncle from both her paternal and maternal sides. For the Greeks, the uncle was a relative whose chief role is to care for his niece or nephew in a protective way, and this myth uh, demonstrates the complete opposite of that. What happens to Persephone in the underworld isn't really told to us from ancient sources, though many have created their own stories since, which usually revolve around a Persephone and Hades forming a Cupid and Psyche type relationship. I've done a whole video on that myth if you're not familiar. Yet, according to the Homeric hymn, Persephone doesn't settle into her new relationship and circumstances as quickly as contemporary retellings suggest. The poem reads such, she was sitting in the bed with Hades, her bedmate, much against her will, and yearning for her mother. Like so many mythological women before her, Persephone is initiated into womanhood via rape. We see this in the hymn when her name, Kore, meaning maiden, becomes meaningless, and she is thenceforth becomes Persephone in the underworld, but is still called Kore by Zeus when discussing her return to Earth. Before her descent to the underworld, Persephone had no true name. She was merely a maiden, something which Euripides and Carcanos point out. She's only named Persephone once she has been initiated, violated, given a purpose in the patriarchal society that she lives in. The rape of Persephone becomes a cosmic event, plunging the world into an apocalyptic famine until she's restored back to Earth and made a symbolic maiden again. She is initiated, she effectively dies, and then is reborn Kore again, or Kore again. We see in the epithets of Sophocles' Antigone that the death of the unmarried girl is much like a wedding. Artemidoros says that, quote, marriage resembles death and is signified by death. For a virgin to dream of marriage indicates her death. For all that happens to one who marries also happens to the dead. As Ellie Mackin explains, naming Persephone becomes a way of evoking the connection between marriage and death. In Athens, for example, prematurely dead girls were buried wearing wedding clothes and given grave goods that resembled wedding gifts. However, the girls buried with bridal objects and iconography were not being offered as Hades to be brides by their parents. Rather, the form of the burial can be read as a way of giving these girls the opportunity to undergo the experience that would have defined life as a woman. Additionally, Evadne, in Euripides' Suppliant Women, declares that she will arrive at Persephone's bridal chamber as she throws herself onto her husband's burning funeral pyre. Evadne uses this phrase to illuminate the story that she wants to compose about herself, the story in which she stays with her husband, irrespective of the cost to herself, her own life. Advadni uses Persephone as a metonymy for her actual meaning, the enduring connection between marriage and death. As we know, the myth of Persephone doesn't end there. The cycle of life and death and rebirth of Persephone continues for all eternity thanks to the pomegranate seeds that Hades makes her eat, binding the two of them together. Now, the symbolism of the pomegranate and its seeds is pretty immense, so there's no single way to interpret it. So one is that the bright red pomegranate is an image for the bloody death in numerous Greek myths and rites, and its seeds symbolises the germinative and productive angle of its symbol, thus giving rise to the ideas of life and rebirth. 
Further, Lincoln explains, the red colour evokes associations not only with mortal wounds, but also of menstrual blood, and the blood of defloritation, and the blood of partuition, the blood of life as well as death, sexual blood, and women's blood. The prodigious number of seeds within a pomegranate has always made it a symbol of exuberant female fertility, but there's also a male association. The term used for seed in the Homeric hymn is kokos, which actually means, or can mean, um, testicle as well as seed, which is to say that the male organ which produces abundant seed, no less vital to fertility than its male counterpart. The pomegranate seed symbolises death, life, male and female. As Persephone consumed it, she consumed with it a new identity, a mature, fertile and complex woman who has crossed the barrier which cannot be uncrossed. So what about archaeologically speaking? Well, between 1908 and 1909, Italian archaeologist Paolo Orsi met, found a small rectangular building and a large ritual pit that contained thousands of fragments of offerings to Persephone in the southern Italian settlement of Locri. Dedications to the cult included terracotta pinnakees, terracotta pomegranates and figurines showing Persephone as a fertility or mother goddess, not unlike young Demeter. Pinnakees are terracotta relief plaques and are some of the finest artistic examples of the ancient culture of the Magna Graecia. The pinnakees found were produced at the end of the 6th century BCE to around 470 BCE, although the material found in the pit ranges from as late as the 7th and the 4th centuries BCE. The pinnakees show Persephone's divine abduction, imitation, abductions of young girls by their own beardless grooms, scenes of Persephone either alone or with Hades, and receiving nuptial offerings, images of Aphrodite and still life images of nuptial offerings. Most of them are predominantly dedicated to Persephone, although some may have been dedicated to Aphrodite, who was a subordinate divinity of the cult, and a figure of worship elsewhere in the city. Persephone and Aphrodite, along with their consorts, represented the spectrum of love and lust appropriate to marriage-related cults, partly concerned with fertility as well. Persephone, legitimately united with Hades, protects and nourishes marriage, fertility, and the safe production of children, whilst Aphrodite, with her lover Hermes, embodies the totality of love and sex, even when that might have been deemed as perverted. The Pinnakees were most likely dedications made by young girls in the lead-up to their wedding, and served as a function for seeking Persephone's blessing and protection for their marriage. The most common Pinnax features the divine and imitation scenes. In both cases, these range from unambiguous abductions, where the maiden clearly struggles against her captor, to images in which she appears as the girl is complicit in her own kidnapping, sometimes even taking charge of the chariot herself. The range can be accounted for because, as James Redfield points out, no doubt some brides felt more abducted than others. So there's no actual evidence that mock abductions occurred uh, as marriage rituals in Lockery, though it doesn't actually really matter. You see, mythologically speaking, the rites of passage were often conceived as a death and rebirth, and in religious practice, they, this was symbolised as a kind of death of the person's former status. So, in the context of marriage, writes Persephone's story was a perfect model. So, having heard all this, why do we continue to romanticise the myth of Hades and Persephone? If you were to take a glance at Goodreads, you will see that there are more than 300 retellings of the myth out there, residing primarily within the romance and YA genres, which is young adult genres for those unfamiliar. Well, in reality, the psychology behind the appeal is very much aligned with the appeal of stories such as Beauty and the Beast, Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey. You can't get more of a bad boy trope than the Lord of the Underworld, who has the potential to be balanced out and taught better ways by the opposite. This delicate woman is there solely to heal their darkened soul and show them for what love truly is. But the sexist string that a woman can fix a violent and controlling man, who she falls in love with despite being constantly raped, controlled, degraded, coerced, isolated from friends and families, stalked and possessed by him, is lessened by the sexy trade-off. Power. Being raped and abused aren't bad things in literature and media, as long as the trade-off is worth it, as it allows for it to be romanticised. 
Persephone becomes queen of the bloody underworld, Bella becomes an immortal vampire, and Anastasia's billionaire boyfriend who buys her publishing company that she works for, in the end, marries her, and she becomes a billionaire by through marriage, and then takes over the publishing company herself and becomes the CEO. But the major mistake here is that Hades has been wrongly attributed to the bank of boy status through, you know, Christianity and the evolution of the devil trope, which is misappropriately placed upon him via what we understand as the, quote, underworld and hell, etc. Hades had no bad relations in terms of ancient Greek mythology. There was no evil sin related to being underworld. Everyone went to the underworld, whether you were good or bad. Uh, he is no devil creature. But because we associate Hades with more dominant Christian ideas and tropes of the devil, he's labelled as a bad boy, and therefore the myth of Persephone and Hades can be retold in the same love-hate trope, enemies-to-lovers trope, that is so popular in today's society but uh, can be predominantly quite toxic uh, across the board. And most people get around this problem by actually changing the circumstances in which the two meet. For example, Lore Olympus, which is a graphic arts novel about Persephone and Hades, completely changes the circumstances in which they meet one another by removing the abduction and thus removing the lack of consent between the two and just creates a story of one becoming the Lord of the Underworld and the Lady of the Underworld, the Queen of the Underworld, and a gentle romance between the two. It's not as toxic as, say, just a general leading on from the actual abduction of Persephone and Hades. And I suppose in terms of most relationships, when we look at the Greek myths, theirs is one of the most easily romanticizable because it is the least aggressive out of all of them. Uh, it's not like it's later on the frickin' swan, is it? Um, but it's still uh, not the nicest. It's quite a sad, sad story to read, how she constantly cries and kicks and screams and she's absolutely terrified. And the idea that she's terrified is perpetuated and emphasized throughout the poem. It's actually a really sad story. And it's wonderful that when Demeter catches her and finds her and brings her home, whereas that part of the tale is actually normally retold as a mother butting into a budding relationship and not being able to let go of her little baby girl. When we have to reimagine that the fact that the story is about a girl who gets kidnapped and raped against her will, and the only person standing up for her when she's powerless is her mother, and her father is the most powerful god in the entirety of the world, has put her in this position, and her mother goes against the top dog. Her mother is so dedicated to her daughter's well-being that she goes against the god of all gods and brings her daughter home, and actually technically wins that battle because he concedes. Despite being the head of Olympus, he actually can't negate the damage that his, one of his affair mistresses, Demeter, actually does to the world. She, a mother scorned does way more damage than a god can undo. He has to retract everything that he put out there. So really, it's kind of a badass story about the mother usurping the greatest patriarchal figure of all time, the god, the king god. But again, emphasis is more on Persephone and Hades, and that's where the romanticization comes from. So yes, that's it for the Persephone. This is a much shorter video, so I can only apologise, but there isn't much out there about Persephone. But we will be going into Hades next time, and then we'll be going into the history of the devil. Also, I'd like to thank you all for using my request a video form. It's always in the description box. I've had 25 requests, and I've written them all down, so thank you. You can either say your name or remain anonymous, that's an option. You do not have to give your name, but if you want a shout out, please say in the description box that you would like to. I mean, in the form, you know what I mean in the form. My dog is wanting attention again. As you can hear, he's battling at the door, so I will go play with him. And I will see you next time for another video. And remember, books save lives, so keep reading.